Hi, I'm Tobias Carlyle. This is the Aquarius Podcast. My special guest today is Andrew Wellington of Lyrical Partners. He's a deep value investor with a focus on quality and analyzability. We're going to talk about how he constructs a portfolio, how he thinks about value, how he identifies value traps, and where he sees the future of value right after this. Tobias Carlyle is the founder and principal of Aquarius Funds. For regulatory reasons, he will not discuss any of the acquirer's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of acquirer's funds or affiliates. For more information, visit acquirersfunds.com. Lyrical, I, I've, I've heard of Lyrical quite a few times. Um, you, you, do, what, what do you do at Lyrical? It's, you have a, a value fund and you ha- do you have a fund of funds as well? Yes, yeah, I'm... Um, people get a little confused by that. And so if you, Lyrical Asset Management, um, which is the business I co-founded, and I co-founded it with my longtime friend, Jeff Keswin. So Jeff and I go back to um, when we were undergrads at University of Pennsylvania. We both were in a small dual degree program there called Management and Technology, uh, which is where you graduate with a degree from Wharton and a degree from the School of Engineering. And we were good friends in college. And when we both got job offers to start working in New York City, we were roommates for two years. And so Jeff started out as a uh, investment banking analyst at Bear Stearns. Uh, This is 1990. And uh, I don't think he liked that very much after a year. (laughs) And he got a job at an investment firm called Siegler Colliery. And um, a short while later, they hired uh, another analyst And then a few years later, he and that other analyst left and started their own hedge fund. And they called it Greenlight Capital. And the other analyst is David Einhorn. Right. (laughs) And uh, David and Jeff built that business into a very successful hedge fund. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm not going to have the the numbers exactly right. But after roughly eight, 10 years together, they split up. Uh, Jeff sold out of his half of the business. And he started something called Lyrical Partners a year or so later which was his, it's not a good word for it, but you can think of it as a family office, a business office. Uh, Jeff pursued a wide range of pursuits, including venture investing and uh, in giving seed capital to other hedge funds. And it also included a fund of funds. Uh, around that time, um, I had been a portfolio manager running the mid cap value strategy at Newberger Berman. And this is the early 2000s when, uh, for the older listeners out there will remember, that's back when value worked. (laughs) And I was putting up some really uh, great returns and just said, you know, you're a better stock picker than my friends that run billion dollar hedge funds. Why are you being an idiot and working for some big mutual fund company? You should quit your job immediately and start your own hedge fund. And I wasn't really ready to make the leap at that time. Uh, But as I was approaching my 40th birthday at the end of 2007, um, it was before the financial crisis, but value stocks started to get cheap way before 08. And I was seeing a lot of opportunity out there. And a lot of things that hadn't lined up before had were now lining up. And so um, in late 07, and then really officially in 08, um, I decided to start my own firm. I knew I could pick the stocks, I knew I could run the portfolio, but run the business, run the office, um, the legal, the accounting, and uh, most of my clients had been very, very large institutions that would never invest in a startup manager, where Jeff had a great Rolodex of uh, clients and customers. So we got together and Lyrical Partners was still in existence and it had a fund of funds and he was doing some things in real estate and he was still giving money to venture businesses and under that umbrella. I was joking. I wanted to call it Wellington Capital Management. It's a good name. It turns out that name was taken. <laughs> so we came up with the next best thing, which is uh, Lyrical Asset Management. And so Lyrical is kind of uh, the, the label you could think of as Jeff Keswin's alter uh, ego in business. And uh, if you really get to know the firm, Lyrical is a great name for it because, um, well, it's hard to put in precise words. It kind of gets to the the culture of the firm um, about, uh, you know, Jeff says Lyrical kind of comes from he wanted to just do things with people um, after he left the, the, the hedge fund industry, uh, just do things with people. And uh, that is kind of what Lyrical broadly is all about. So. Uh, 
you you started though before Newberger Berman. You were at Pazina. You were a, you were a founding analyst at Pazina. I was, which is um, a very pompous way to say that I had spent five years in management consulting, knew absolutely nothing about investing, and therefore I was cheap, <laughs> I think. And Rich Pazina, um, who came from Sanford Bernstein, uh, had a, I think knew that he could take uh, good people and train them to be good analysts. And so, yes, I was one of the original employees. I, you know, Rich hired me at, at founding. And so there were two analysts at the firm. Neither of one of us had worked at, as equity analysts at the time. Um, but yes, yeah, so I can claim to be a founding member of that firm. And, um, you know, I really stumbled into an incredible opportunity. I didn't know anything about investing other than what I had learned in my classes at Wharton. Asset management wasn't really a popular career path uh, in the late 80s. You know, and I was at Wharton, so if it was going to be popular somewhere, it was going to be popular yeah. at Wharton. A decade later, everybody wanted to go work for a hedge fund. But in the late 80s, and I graduated in 1990, nobody was going there. It was all consulting and investment banking. I chose consulting. Nobody even watched CNBC back then. It, it, it's, it's, Same it's as today. To remember. <laughs> um, and so after five years of consulting, um, I, I got this opportunity to join Rich Pazina as he was starting Pazina Investment Management, and it, it was, uh, it just seemed like a really great fit. This career path, the, the analytics of it, it had a lot of the things I liked about consulting, uh, and it didn't have a lot of things I didn't like about consulting, like client handholding. Yeah, um, which now this year is seems to be all I'm doing. But <laughs> so um, it is. Go ahead. When you when. When Rich Pazina is hiring for his firm, it must have been a conscious decision not to get guys who had a background in in investing as his analyst. W w why do you think that was? Well, if you go back to where he came from, Sanford Bernstein, at that time, Sanford Bernstein hired a lot of people out of consulting. A lot of the research department there were former McKinsey, and I was at Booz Allen. And so I think that was uh, a labor pool he was used to recruiting from. And the bad part of hiring a consultant is they don't know anything about investing. But the best part about hiring a consultant is they don't know anything about right. investing. <laughs> and so uh, now that I've been doing this for 25 years and I've met with people that have uh, been investors at other firms as possible employees to hire, breaking, uh, let's not call them bad habits, but it's difficult to change somebody's style of investing. And if it doesn't match up with the way you want to invest, that, that can create a lot of problems. So. Um, I, I think that's why he looked for ex-consultants to be his first analysts. Pretty good business analyst consultants. That's that's a, a lot of consultants have a lot of experience doing business analysis without so much of the financial analysis. Is that part of the attraction? Do you think? I think so. Um, you know, I'll say I learned a lot of great things in management consulting. Uh, it provided me a, a fantastic toolkit of of skills that have really helped me in the years afterwards. Uh, it's a different kind of analysis, but it's close enough. And you know, we're talking five years I had worked as a management consultant, which if you do the math, I graduated college, it means I was still 27. Now, when I was 27, I thought I knew a lot. Now that I'm in my 50s, I realize how I didn't know anything at 27. <laughs> um, so you're still so early in your career. Um, but yeah, you, you, you come in with a lot of the, the core skills. You just are applying them in a slightly different way to the task of equity research. And fortunately, uh, Rich Pazina was a great guy to learn how to be an equity analyst, how to apply those skills to the sphere of investing and value investing in equity research and analysis. So when you uh, shift from, you go to Pazina to Newberger Berman, and then you, you set up Lyrical what is the investment style at Lyrical? What's the philosophy? How do you characterize what you do? And what, what do you take from, say, Pazina and Newberger Berman? Yeah, Lyrical, we, we say the, the Lyrical way is VQA. Uh, it stands for value, quality, and analyzability. And I kind of think of each of those jobs added one of those letters. So at Pazina, it starts with value. Uh, that's where I learned how to be a value investor. And we are first and foremost value investors. You know, our goal at Lyrical is to generate the highest returns we possibly can. And the way we know of to do that is through value investing. That you know, the, the way you generate high returns is to buy a business at a discount to what it's worth. And we don't wanna be just value investors, we wanna be deep value investors because the bigger that discount, the bigger the return you generate if you're right. 
So that's where value comes from. When I went to Newburger Berman, um, I, I had spent five years at Pazina and I felt like I, I learned a lot, uh, enough that Newburger was willing to hire me and make me a portfolio manager. And that really was the appeal there of getting a chance to have, at that time, a billion dollar pool of capital and, and run it the way I wanted to. And that's where quality came in. Um, what I noticed as an analyst at Pazina was that when I was analyzing a bad business that was volatile or had low returns on capital, I was wrong a lot. And when I analyzed a good business, I was right a lot. And it didn't matter how hard I worked. Yeah. <laughs> what mattered was I'm right on the good businesses and wrong on the bad businesses. So I didn't want to work on the bad businesses anymore. Uh, so. Uh, and it was liberating too. the the job I got at Newberger Berman was to run the mid cap value strategy. And one of the great things about mid cap is there are no important stocks in the benchmark in a large cap. I mean, look at how much the five largest stocks in the S&P 500, they're, they're, they're 20, 25 percent of that index. They they're a huge factor in determining. So everybody's focused on those five at the expense of the other four hundred ninety five. Right. In mid cap, no one stock's important. So you start with a totally clean sheet of paper and you just own what you want. You don't have that other, those those big components to distract you. And so I built a valuation screen, which I still use today. And as I went through it, I noticed that, say, in the auto industry, on my screen, we had, back then, Johnson Controls was was in the automotive seating business. And you had them who had grown their profits for 15 straight years, had positive revenue for something like 45 years. And right below that on the screen was Ford or General Motors, which didn't have anywhere near that kind of success. And so I, you know, I would look at this and why would anybody want to own Ford or GM when they can own a much better business in Johnson Controls? And that there were these good businesses in, amongst all the cheap stocks. and. Let's just, they, they both have the same upside according to the model. So why don't we analyze the good one and have a better chance of being right than look at these bad ones? One thing that bad ones often had going for them was much larger market cap. But, you know, if you're going for returns and not trying to, we're trying to maximize returns, not maximize weighted average market cap. And so that's where quality came in. And then um, I was forming Lyrical during 2008, which only a contrarian value manager would quit their job early, you know, and start their own firm in the middle of a financial crisis. Uh, but where everyone else saw uh, terror, I, we, I saw opportunity. Like, I, I didn't know if we were going to raise a dime of capital, but I knew our since inception returns were going to be really, really good. <laughs> <laughs> how, how do you and, characterize a good business? Yeah, you know, we say the word quality, and I think quality means different things to different peoples. But it's it's just a good label, and I could say it's not important what your definition of quality is. Uh, for us, specifically, what we look for as the primary quantitative measure of quality is return on invested capital. And uh, there's two reasons why we look for return on invest, or two sort of uh, rationales. Uh, why we look at return on invested capital. One is if a business invests money in itself and generates a poor return on that, then what kind of return can you hope to achieve as an investor in that business? So there is some logical connection between your return as an investor in a business and its return on invested capital. Now, you could take a higher OIC business, pay three times too much for it and still have a bad result. But uh, it's really hard. And, and you could buy something cheap enough that if it has terrible returns, you could do OK. But there is this linkage between ROIC, return, the returns the company generates on itself, and what you hope to generate as an investor in that business. And the other thing is the inverse of ROIC, which is capital intensivity. And so I've found what really helps being right as an analyst is investing in resilient businesses, flexible businesses. And when you have a lot of capital employed in your business, that makes you very rigid. Your costs are rigid. Your supply is rigid. You're not very adaptable. And so when you do this for a long time, what you notice is that companies have ROI, high ROIC, not because of the numerator, but mostly because of the denominator. It's capital light businesses that have high ROICs. Uh, it's in, so it leads you to capital light businesses, which are more flexible, are more resilient. And so as the future unfolds differently than you expect, which happens all the time, every time, the business adapts and it ends up that the change in results of the company are far lower or you know mitigated 
compared to the change in expectations. So long-winded way of saying we define quality as return on invested capital. And somewhat related to that is you also want to avoid companies with excessive leverage on their balance sheet. Those are the two primary quant things we can quantify that we look for. You gave a presentation to the CFA Society where you were talking about value traps and you contrasted in the first instance air cap with UAL. Um, which I thought was very interesting because it's not an, it's not a comparison that I've seen before, but it makes complete sense. And you show that UAL has these various years where it has hugely negative, uh, has this, it, it's obviously very cyclical, whereas AirCap is not particularly cyclical at all. It doesn't seem to move around much. Is that one of the is that one of the things that you're looking for? Is that is that resilience or is that sort of a, an average ROIC over a cycle? Well, how are you thinking about that? Yeah. So that comparison I like a lot because, you know, Aircap leases the air, leases airplanes to airlines around the world. And when we look at how the stocks reacted in the COVID pandemic, especially earlier this year, the market treated them the same. And yet you look at the results and they're night and day. Um, United Airlines earnings, I think, are down something like 300 percent this year. They're going from making money to losing 2x or 3x what they were supposed to make. And while Aircap did just take a charge, um, it's a non-cash charge. It's a, a basically a present value of an expected reduction in future earnings. Still, their book value is going to be basically flat this year. We've had the greatest crisis to ever hit the commercial aviation industry by a magnitude of, of you know, three or four X what the worst recession ever in history was. And their book value is flat this year. Yeah, I mean, extraordinary. Pretty rich. So if this didn't do it, what the hell's gonna, what the heck's gonna lower their book value? And so, and if you look back over the last economic cycle, their book value grew like fourteen percent a year during the financial crisis. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> so, it's you got to really worry if the airlines are going to survive and make it, and. If all the airlines go bankrupt, that will definitely have a negative impact on, on air cap. But they're so insulated from that that it will take a crisis many times worse than what we experienced this year to um, really negatively impact them. And yet they had the same stock reaction pretty much. And air cap still is trading at a fraction of book value when if this year didn't lower the book value, what's going to do it? Yeah. Uh when you uh, implement your strategy, you, you you have long short portfolios and long only portfolios. Is that how do you? Is that true? Is that am I characterizing that correctly? We don't uh, do long short. Uh, we're just long only. Um, long short may be something we have looked at in the past. It may be something we look at into the future. Honestly, the, the world doesn't seem to want long short anymore. So it's um, tough out there for a short seller. It, it, <laughs> it is. Um, so. Our original product is a concentrated U.S. value portfolio, large cap value portfolio. And then over the last years, we've developed um, and applied our U.S. process to a universe of non-U.S. stocks. Uh, and so we have we we have um, so we look at the thousand largest U.S. and the fifteen hundred largest non-U.S. And what comes out of that is a global portfolio, which you can have either just the U.S. version or the international version or or both. Um, but we've been doing inter U.S. the longest. That's where most of our assets are. Um, let's talk about concentration, diversification. What, what's your definition of, of concentrated and how do you think about diversification in that context? Diversification is the best risk management tool. You know, it is truly the only free lunch in finance. And so um, you want to take advantage of that. Uh, because you know this is investing is about making predictions about the future, and when you make predictions about the future, you're wrong a lot. Yeah, that's just the nature of it. And so, how do you protect yourself against that? You diversify, uh, and so it it is a tricky balance. You don't want to de-worsify, and so I think we you know one way to answer that is we want to own as many stocks as we can that meet are cr acceptable criteria for investment. You don't want to own things that aren't don't meet your criteria to get more diversified. 
uh, you, there's nothing out there that exists that we have to own for the sake of diversification. It's not about what we don't own. It's about making sure we don't own too much of any one thing that we do own. The academic literature and the math will tell you that if they're sufficiently different, you as long as you have 30 something stocks or more, you're pretty much achieving all the benefits of diversification that you get with a hundred stock or several hundred stock portfolio. So we'd like to own about 30 something stocks, which is what we do own. Uh, you're okay at 25, but you start getting below that, you lose a lot of benefits of diversification. Uh, but owning 33 different banks isn't diversified. <laughs> so we look at it from the industry point of view. We would like to have 33 stocks from 33 different industries. Our investment criteria are too difficult, um, too tough for us to actually find 33 stocks from 33 different industries, but we still end up with something like 27 or 28 different industries out of 33 stocks, and there's some things we may own two of. And then we have a hard rule under no circumstances, no matter how great it looks, we will never own more than three stocks that do the same thing or are exposed to the same thing. Uh, and so when you get things wrong, when you get one thing wrong, you like to have one thing wrong. You don't want to get one thing wrong and, and have it be 10 stocks in the portfolio that suffer because of that. Right. When you're uh, looking for ideas, how are, you, how are you sourcing? How are you filtering? How are you validating? Yeah, I believe the most important step in the investment process is idea generation. Everything comes from that. And if you generate mediocre ideas and you give it to the best equity analyst in the world, it's going to be a mediocre stock that you know a lot about. <laughs> and if you give a great stock to a mediocre analyst, they may not do good work, but it still is a great investment. So you're only as good as the ideas that you can generate. And I think it's really important that you generate your ideas through, For our, we think screening is the way to do it. Um, otherwise, you don't come up with, you, you mentioned a little earlier, AirCap versus United Airlines. Well, you're not going to find AirCap any way but screening. Uh, it's not really written about in the papers. Nobody's talking about it. And um, so I, we think the best way to generate ideas is, is to screen. Um, and screening is a skill. I think we have a really good screen, but it's just a tool. And if I gave that screen to 10 other investment firms, they would generate different ideas from it than we would, because it's how you use it, how you look at it. Uh, I, I like to joke, you know, our screen's kind of like Roger Federer's tennis racket. In fact, when I played tennis, I used the same model he did. It just didn't work the same in my hands <laughs> as it did in his. You know, it's, it is an effective tool, and you can't play tennis without the racket, but it's how you use it that matters. So you can use that screen and skip over all the ideas that we happen to find out of it. Uh, you can get stuck on the names all the way at the top that may be bad data or bad businesses and miss the one that's on line 17 because you, you got busy with lines 1 through 10. So there's a lot in how you use it. But without that screen, we couldn't generate good original ideas and, and find you know, our goal. We can get into this more. Our goal in managing the portfolio is we want to own the 30-something the best stocks we can find. And when we find one that's better than what we already own, then we sell one and we buy another. And that's kind of how we manage the portfolio. And you're not going to find the best ideas unless you have some good tool to do that. And so I think screening is, is just critical. Uh, I've seen AirCap in David Einhorn's portfolio, and it comes up in my screens too, funnily enough. It's, I think it's one of the, one of the uh, better opportunities out there uh, right now. It's certainly been... Um, popping up in screen. So I agree with you that uh, I think that as a deep value guy in mid cap, it's likely that we overlap uh, pretty frequently on some of these names. Um, so once you find these ideas on the screen, how do you then move forward to the validation process? How do you, what's the difference between what's in the screen and what's in the portfolio? Yeah, I, it's a iterative process. Uh, I like to do triage. And so you, you can, there's, there's some things that look good on the screen and, and after a little bit of work, you can quickly dismiss them um, because you see something like asbestos lawsuit <laughs> in the research notes or uh, I, on our screen, number one on our screen for a while was uh, Pacific Gas and Electric. And obviously right. the screen wasn't taking into account that they set the state of California on fire <laughs> and might be liable for that. So the screen's a very good tool, but an imperfect one. And so you do a little bit of work and some of the names immediately and just keep, in, in some sense, you just keep doing work 
until you can't dismiss it anymore. Yeah. You keep looking for a reason not to own it. And at some point you've, you've turned over every rock and stone <laughs> and there's, you can't find a good reason. Um, that's a, a little bit of a simplification, but we have a team of four people, uh, including myself, and we all go through the screen and we all look for ideas and we uh, will do a little bit of work and we'll talk about what ideas look interesting and we'll agree on one name. That's our top priority. And then we actually all independently do our homework on it. And some of the work we'll share. It's, you don't need four people to create the same spreadsheet. Uh, we'll divide and conquer a bit. Um, but it's just, it's hard to describe, but it's its traditional old-fashioned research. You, you study up on the business. You figure out what are the things I got to worry about. You try to build a financial model and think about what are the important stuff you got to get right to get that right. And if uh, if the model says it's got good future earnings and you can buy it at a low price, and most importantly, we, we haven't talked about this yet, uh, a concept we call analyzability. You know, I can put numbers into a spreadsheet to come up with future earnings for any business. But for some of them, you know, for a lot of them, I'm not going to believe it. Yeah, I, mean, I could build a model on Citigroup, uh, but I'm now finally old enough and wise enough to know not to believe it. <laughs> because they're just numbers in a spreadsheet you're making up. You actually can't forecast it. But you take something else like, I mean, one of the simplest businesses we have in the portfolio is a company called Crown Holdings, and they make beer cans and soda cans. You can model that. <laughs> you know, you can get that business right. You're not going to get it right to the penny, but, you know, take bets. Which stocks earnings do you think you're going to get right five years from now, a Crown Holdings or a Citigroup? And just one's inherently more analyzable. It's easier to get right. It's simpler. It's more transparent. And so... Uh, that's, I think, a key thing that, that separates lyrical. A lot of people have done a lot of work to study on what works in investing. And as I was talking about earlier with, with stuff like quality, I, we've put a lot of thought into what works in research. And the thing that works in research is analyze easy businesses, and you'll get more of them right. And there's a certain bravado in value investing that wants to tackle the really hard one with the most complicated financials. But the reality is the more complicated it is, the harder the task. You, perhaps there's more value hidden, but also it's, you're much less likely to actually get it right. And if you just look a little harder, screen a little harder, what you'll find is there's something just as cheap with just as much upside that's a whole lot easier to figure out. So we'd rather work really, really hard to find easy investments. They're harder to find, but when you find them, they're, it's a lot easier. You still got to do the good fundamental research and figure out how the business works, what drives it, and, and get those assumptions roughly right. But again, the, the easier a business is, the greater your chance is of getting it right. So you're looking for tractability, needs to be understandable, no tail risk, so no um, asbestos liabilities or, or <laughs> liabilities from setting California a lot, and then high returns on invested capital or higher than average returns on invested capital and, and, well, I would and just correct, low price. It's, it's not high returns invested capital. It's about avoiding low returns on invested capital. It's about having a floor. Our absolute floor is 10%. Our preference is 15. But I'd rather own a cheaper company with a 16% ROE than a not cheap, not that cheap company with a 60. Uh, there really isn't that much of a difference between 60 and 16. Uh, so it's more about avoiding the bad than it is about seeking the great. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Um, so you, you've got a position in the portfolio. It grows pretty rapidly relative to the rest of the portfolio. How do you handle that? Are you, do you trim them back? Because I, I, I saw that uh, in one of your notes you said um, you don't. You, there was no rebalancing. Correct. We don't rebalance. And it's because the data tells us not to. Um, well, the data says is right now the data says not to, but it's by a small margin. What we find is, and we, so we don't rebalance, but we can test what would our returns be if we did monthly rebalancing because we know all the stocks. We're just changing the weights. Or what if we did uh, semi-annual rebalancing? Or what if we did annual rebalancing? So we've tested all those, and what we basically find out is our returns end up the same, within. Uh, a very small range. Now, from year to year, we have we've been around for 12 years. Or so, from year to year, some years rebalancing our returns would be one or two points higher. Some years, one or two points lower. Over 12 years, it's almost entirely canceled itself out. Except, the best scenario of all those, by a small margin, is the don't rebalance at all. And you and don't incur tax too if you do that. Th so, 
rebalancing has a lot of negatives when you do it. You incur trading costs, you have the potential for trading errors, it's less tax efficient. And so there should be some provable positive that you are going after to offset all those negatives. And I, I would say the data clearly shows that um, for us, at least, I don't know about every strategy, but for our strategy, the data shows there's no return benefit from rebalancing. Now, some of that has to do with what we're dealing with. You know, um, we have a mostly equal weighted portfolio of 33 stocks. So when everything starts at around three, if it gets really big, what is it, five? You know, we're not talking about- right. and if, and well, let's say it got doubled in size. It got to six. Now, trimming something from six to three sounds like a big deal, doesn't it? On the day you trim from six to three, ninety-seven percent of your portfolio doesn't change. Right. So, how much is it going to really impact the returns? And I think that's why the data comes out the way it does. Is when you look at this rebalancing, you really—it looks like you're moving around a lot at the position level, but at the portfolio level. It just doesn't add up to enough of the portfolio to really make a difference in returns. So uh, we choose not to do it. Now, if something gets to be 10%, then we get nervous. We get nervous when <laughs> you get to two digits of, of position weight. And if it gets to 10, we trim it to nine. And it goes up more and gets to 10, we'll trim it back to nine. But um, we, we don't. We just found through the numbers, it's. It, I know philosophically, in a way, it doesn't make sense. Wait a minute. You, you had it at 5% when it was $10 a share. Now it's $20 a share and it's bigger. Why do you have more of it when it's less cheap? I don't have an answer for that other than the data says it doesn't change my returns. So, and this is something we could very easily quantify and test. And so let's not waste time on all this rebalancing. Let's focus on getting as many of these 33 stocks right as possible. What about the opposite scenario where something goes against you? Will you uh, will you keep on buying to sort of bring it up to equal weight? Uh, no, we're we're consider we don't trim things when they go up, and we don't buy more when they go down. And um, one, you know, we, we could the most the the best test of that could, that is what rebalancing is, just in a systematic way. Every time something goes down, you buy more, and every time it goes up, you trim it. That's rebalancing, right? Uh, and so. Um, and there are stocks in the past we would have done better if we bought more, and there are stocks in the past if we bought more we would have done worse. And I think the rebalancing analysis shows that if we do this long enough, it's going to end up with probably no difference at all. It also just again um, it makes the job of of being of a decision maker easier. We have one decision to make: in or out. And waiting is kind of off the table, and we just focus on: do we still think this is one of the 33 best stocks we can own or not? If it is, stays in. And um, when I was at Newberger, I used to trade around my positions all the time. And I'd look at my sheets every morning and I'd say, oh, this one's only two and a half. Maybe I'll make that three. And then I put in the order and then I'd be watching the, the stock all day to see how how'd I do. Did I buy it at the low of the day? And then I'd be tracking it for the next few weeks. Like, was it good to add there? And when I did all this analysis um, to see how much of a difference this stuff made and found it made no difference at all, or actually probably was a slight negative, um, I took it out of the, the, the process. And then what I found is it was about lunchtime and I was done with all my work for the day because <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't wasting all this time thinking about trading, thinking about the order, tracking it. It's a huge distraction. And I think it just makes us, you don't realize it. I didn't realize it at the time. How, if I estimated how much time it, it took of my mind, I would have grossly underestimated it. It was only until I took it out of the process that I saw how much it, time it freed up. And that's time we now have to focus on just making sure the stocks we own are the right stocks to own, look for new investments and focus on the more important things. Um, you're a deep value guy in the mid cap space. Uh, it's been it's been a mixed bag for deep value and uh, add for value in the states in particular. So the first decade of the 2000s was absolutely spectacular for value, and the last decade's been quite tough. I think probably value and quality would have done quite well through to say 2018, the very beginning of 2018, and then it's been a long sort of grind lower since then. Do you do you have any view on? Um, what it would take for value to turn around or if value sort of turned around already? 
Yeah, I would say it, it has one. Well, let me correct you on one thing. We're, we're, we're not a mid cap manager where I would describe us as a large cap manager. I did run mid cap at Newburger, but our investment universe is the thousand largest U.S. stocks. So um, I would say that is the large cap and mid cap universe. Um, but um, so what will it take for value to turn around right now? It looks like what it takes for value to turn around is the calendar to flip from March 18th to March 19th. Um, right now, that looks like the bottom. And so, yeah, you have the correct timing about value. If you looked at the value indices, it looks like they haven't worked for 14 years. But if you looked at look at what we think are better measures of value, like how do the lowest PE stocks perform, they outperformed by quite a large margin from 09 through 17. The value's only been underperforming for about two years, 18, 19, and then a pretty nasty downturn in March, in February, March of this year as the pandemic erupted. And then they bottomed on March 18th. And by our calculation, the lowest PE stocks in the US are up over 80% since March 18th. That's almost 30 percentage points better than the S&P 500. They're in a big hole, so they haven't completely dug their way out. But going up 80% in nine months is a good start. And to my point earlier about the value indices, while the lowest PE stocks are up 80% and have outperformed by almost 30 percentage points, the large cap value indices have underperformed the S&P. Right. So, and this isn't new. Um, the large cap value indices underperformed the S&P over those nine years from 09 through 17 when the lowest PE stocks outperformed. And this is just, those indices aren't great at capturing what value really is. And it's a shame because it's turned a lot of uh, allocators off of investing in value stocks, thinking it's broken, when it's the indices that are broken, not value investing. But we did have this really tough period uh, from 18, 18 and 19. But the tech bubble was worse for me. I mean, <laughs> uh, yeah. that's the advantage of experience. I've lived, this is now the third period where values underperformed that I've lived through, the first being the tech bubble and the, the second being the financial crisis. And compared to those two, this was a piece of cake. Um, you know, the, the tech bubble was more severe in terms of growth uh, outperforming value. And the financial crisis was just scary for everything. I mean, I didn't, I was starting to think, you know, what am I going to do for a living? Because I can't be an investor in the stock market that's going away. So those were much scarier times than this. Also, you know, by far of, of this period, the, the worst performance was in 2018 for value. And it was actually the best year for company earnings in Lyrical's 12 year history. So it was difficult to put up with the market action, but there really wasn't much doubt that we own the right companies. Our companies were growing, they were growing faster than the S&P 500. Just when their earnings went up, their multiples went down and the stocks underperformed. But they weren't facing any existential threats. It was easy to know as an analyst, you had gotten the right stocks right. It was just uh, very trying for the business as clients grew frustrated with performance and things like that to deal with that side of it. Do you have any thoughts on what caused it? Caused the downturn? Just the just the little that little air pocket that value saw 2018, 2019, and a little bit of this year. Yeah, um, no idea at all. I mean, I've been thinking about this for 25 years, and I'm still no closer to finding why does value go through cycles. It is a, a mystery. Um, it always seems to be. So, I think it's it's it, it's a two step process. I think there's the initial thing that happens that gets value to underperform for a bit of time. And that's different every time. Um, it could be economic fear. It could be falling in love with the internet for the first time. Um, something gets value to underperform enough that the second thing happens, which is the positive feedback loop of momentum. That, you know, so it's a different trigger every time, which is why it's hard to find a systematic cause. But something pushes, um, value to the certain point where people start to give up on it. And that causes it to underperform some more, yeah. which causes more people. So there, it's a compound effect. Something gets the ball rolling, you know, so you got this boulder perched at the top of a hill. Uh, what gets it rolling is different than what keeps it rolling. What keeps it rolling is gravity or momentum, but what gets it rolling is just a really strong wind or, or just a slight little tremor. Just something seems to happen and it's not regular enough that you could actually trade around it. But if you go back and you study the performance of, of low value stocks, 
this happens about two years every 10 years. You got eight years of outperformance and two years of underperformance. Sometimes it's 12 and one, sometimes it's, you know, seven and, and two. But, you know, there is a, if you zoom out, we see this recurring pattern over the last 60 years that you have value outperforms for a while and then you get two years of, of retrenchment and then it outperforms. And it's okay because if you just held, you know, the, over, the good years and the bad years all put together, you still end up with close to 500 basis points of outperformance over a full cycle. The down cycles tend to be more acute. The, the annualized returns are more negative then, but it's just two years. And then you get very good positive returns over eight years and, and eight years of compounding overwhelms those two bad years. But two years is enough to, to shake some people loose. And that's you know the challenging part of value investing. And I, I don't know why it goes through these cycles, but it clearly does. One of the things that I've observed, and I don't know if it's not necessarily quantifiable, but I think that value tends to sell off first. So, I, you, you know, I, I think that in 2007, that was certainly true that I think value sort of started dipping first. And I think you know, it's, a, it's a longer bow, but I do think the late 1990s was value kind of selling off. And then there was a very big sell off for the market and for the tech stocks where value was doing quite well through that period. Value just being long only, you were you could be going up while the rest of the market was going down. I don't know that we've seen the end of this cycle yet, or maybe we have, but I, I thought that we'd seen, I think we'd seen a couple of years of sell-off before the market kind of woke up. I, I just wonder if it's value being a little bit more disciplined about what, uh, value investors being a little bit more disciplined about what they're prepared to pay in the sense that they just, the bid goes away for value when the market gets very frothy. And so value sort of starts retrenching. You know, I think that might be right for one cycle, but you know, I think when you go back and look at these cycles, it's always a different set of circumstances. It's really hard to come up with one reason. So you might be able to figure out what caused it this time. Although this time's the hardest one for me to figure out. Like we, the global, I know what to, value underperformed in 07 and 08. And I know what to label that. That was a global financial crisis and value underperformed in 98, 99. And I know what to label that. That was the tech bubble. I don't know what label to put on this. You know, what happened in 18 that was different than 17? It, I still don't know. I mean, you kind of have the fangs, but this was way bigger than just the fangs. Um, you know, you take the fangs out of the market and you still saw it happen. So I'm not really sure what was behind it this time. I don't know what label to put on it. This one's still a head scratcher. Maybe it'll be clearer in hindsight, but I kind of doubt that too. You know, we're, ne we're never going to know more about, you know, we're not going to remember 2018. It just really came out of the blue. Um, November, like th Thanksgiving, 2017, we're ahead of the market again. <laughs> and we get into 18 and low PE stocks underperform almost every single month of 2018. I think it was like 10 out of 12 months they underperformed. It was just brutal. And our companies were beating earnings. And again, we had the best year. The, the highest percentage of the portfolio outperformed earnings expectations that year as just one simple metric. And they under... in. Every other year, companies in our portfolio that beat earnings on average outperform by, I don't know, something like a thousand basis points. That subset of the portfolio, you know, unfortunately, it's unfortunately, it's never a hundred percent of the portfolio. So there's in that year, they underperformed the first time in our 12 year history. And so they beat and then underperformed the market. Yeah. You know, we disaggregated it. And um, there's a something in psychology called the feature positive effect or and which is that we it's hard to see what isn't there. Um, and so when you have a bad year, everyone wants to blame it on, oh, well, look at these bad stocks you own. And I said, yeah, but look at 2009. We had a great year. And look at all these bad stocks. We have, we have bad <laughs> stocks every year. It's and, and we outperform most of those years. So it's not the bad stocks. And so, you know, what's what do we have compared to normal? And what we noticed was we had a normal number of bad stocks and they did a little worse than normal bad. But what really hurt our returns in 2018 was we had an abnormally large number of good stocks from an earnings point of view, and they did abnormally bad. So it wasn't the the losers in a way that hurt us. It was the total absence of stock winners, even when we had, even though they were earnings winners. Um, and I, I don't, I still can't explain why that happened. I could tell you very precisely exactly how much that happened and, and the numbers behind what did happen, but the why is still a great mystery. In one of AQR's papers where the, the guys who would look at value investing, uh, it's not Cliff Astness, but some of his colleagues had looked at this and they 
they just they create this system to test the relationship between fundamentals and performance. And the way that they do it is they give it uh, forward earnings a year in advance. So it's explicitly cheating to do this. And mm-hmm. then they look at the performance. And if you get those results, you, you get a spectacular sharp and sortina for the entire period. But there are two notable periods where it doesn't work. And if anything, the sign is the around the other way. And it was 98, 99. And it's been 2019 and 2020 have been, mm. the relationship is just not, um, it's it's a negative relationship. So that closer you're tied to fundamentals, the worse you do. Yeah, I mean, that certainly is what it felt like. And uh, Wes Gray did a great paper a few years ago. I think he called it like the God portfolio, or even yeah. God would get fired as a yeah. fund manager, where he actually, you know, looked forward, right, and said, who had the best earnings growth over the next five years? Let's let's own those um, five years early. And even they had huge uh, years of underperformance. But the aggregate returns were, were insane. And, and he even pointed out that, you know, you, you couldn't, even if you were God, you couldn't invest in this strategy because you'd be you'd you're compound fired. at such a high rate, you'd be bigger than the entire stock market. Right. But it was a great exercise to just so show that, like, if you were perfect, you, you owned the, the the ten best earnings grower. That uh, that even then, um, you had bad years in that. But so, I, I guess you could say quite provably, the market does get it wrong from time to time. Yeah. So, Andrew, we're coming up on time. Uh, if folks want to follow along with what you're doing or get in contact with you, what's the best way to do that? Um, yeah. Well, our investor relations contact email is ir at lyricalpartners.com. Um, we have a website, lyricalam.com, where um, we have some of our investor letters and things like that. I will say, you know, most of our content is is for our clients. Uh, we're mostly an institutional uh, investment firm um, and also have a, a very um, significant portion of our assets come through the wealth management channel. Uh, we work very closely with wealth managers. Uh, we don't put a huge amount out there. We don't have a big Twitter presence or things like that. But um uh, some stuff is posted on those websites, and if, if you are interested in some of the, we, we do do a uh, quarterly webcast update call uh, for our, for our clients, and uh, some of that content's available if you, if you contact the uh, IR email box. Um, but you know, um, you know, again, we're we're not. I don't write as much as you do publicly. <laughs> But I'm glad you do because, you know, this podcast, I, I love following your Twitter feed. You're, you're a great resource to follow to see what everybody else is saying in value land. And uh, it gets lonely in years like 2018. And <laughs> it's great to see, you know, oh, good. Cliff Asnes is going through the same trouble we are. And he's really smart. So if he's having trouble, then I feel OK that we're having trouble. There are fewer and fewer guys who want that deep value or value tag on them. Everybody's just I'm just an investor now. I'm no longer a value investor. Yeah, uh, deep value, you know, it, it's a tough term. And I'd say we're not your grandfather's deep value because we have quality. And, and you know, amazingly, uh, the companies we own have grown their earnings faster than the S&P 500 over the last economic cycle, even though they're less than half the price. But um, uh, people will, I, I think, if if things keep going the way they have been going since March 18th and especially these last few months, um uh, the market's always slow to come around to it, but it won't be long before everybody's going to want value again, and it's going to be the the hot topic, uh, the hot thing to be, just like it was in the first decade of the 2000s coming out of the tech bubble. Yeah, I certainly hope so. Uh, Andrew Wellington, Lyrical Partners, thank you for your time. This was fun. You're welcome. <laughs>